I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Digital banking has taken a leap in the last few years, but the process is still heavily dependent on older modes of communication like the SMS. However, SBI and a few other banks seem to be changing that. The country's largest bank recently launched WhatsApp banking, making a foray into new messaging platforms. The new service would allow customers to receive a mini statement and check their account balance. Good morning, I'm Ishan Gera and you're watching the Business Standard Banking Show. In today's episode, we shall discuss the ECB and Fed indications of further rate hikes and the rising bank credit growth. We have an interview lined up with Manisha Girotra, CEO of Moelis India. In our Banking for You section, our experts explain what P2P lending is and our banking expert Tamal Bandupadhyay sheds light on banks' performance in the first quarter and the issue of treasury losses. We will also discuss the results of the last poll at the end of the show and ask you the question for this week. Though everyone was expecting the Fed and the European Central Bank to raise rates in the upcoming meetings, they were not expecting a hawkish stance from either. At the Jackson Hole meeting, Fed Chair Jerome Powell warned of sharper hikes to tame inflation. On the other hand, the European Central Bank was not far behind, and its members indicated a sharp rise in rates to curb inflation. The tone from both the central banks shows that the cycle will take time to turn. Moreover, if ECB and Fed become hawkish on rates, RBI won't be able to hold for long either. It remains to be seen if rates would cross the 6% mark in December itself. Although rates are rising, it has not impacted credit growth. Data from the Reserve Bank of India shows that as of June 17, gross bank credit was up 13.2% and non-food credit was up 13.7%. More important, personal loans were up 18.1% and within that category, consumer durable loans were up a whopping 77.3% compared to last year. If banks can sustain this trend, even with rate rises, then the government may have a serious problem controlling inflation. Moreover, it may eventually lead to a heating up of the economy. Credit card outstanding has been up 30% compared to last year. The number of credit cards in the country increased by 23% in June compared to the previous year as well. However, American Express lost out on this growth as it was banned from issuing new cards that year for non-compliance with RBI's data storage norms. The ban was lifted last week and Amex would try to take advantage of India's burgeoning credit card market. The average credit card spending has been rising and a significant proportion is coming from e-commerce transactions. RBI data showed that in e-commerce transactions, credit card volumes are as high as debit cards. Debit card transactions on ATMs have also risen compared to last year and banks are adding more ATMs to their network. After a slow pace of expansion over previous two years, banks are ramping up their ATM infrastructure. They added 2,796 ATMs between April and July compared to 1,486 in 2021-22 and 2,815 in 2020-21. India has a network of 217,857 ATMs. Much like the ATM network, the deal space in India is also booming. India witnessed $82.3 billion of M&A deals in the first quarter of this fiscal. Business Standards Banking Editor Manojit Saha interviewed Manisha Girotra, CEO of Moelis India to discuss India's deal space and the impact of global headwinds on India. Uh, welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. The Indian deal street is buzzing with activities. In the April-June quarter, India saw 82.3 billion m and deals, the highest amount on record according to Bloomberg data. This was the, 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 the previous highest was 38.1 billion in July, September of 2019. To talk, to talk more about Indian deal space, we have today Manisha Girotra, CEO of Moelis India. Ms. Girotra, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you. Uh, let us start with asking you how much of a challenge the global headwinds pose. I mean, we have interest rate hikes by the developed markets uh, and there are recession fears also. Uh, so how much of it is a challenge to the Indian uh, m and activities? Thanks, Manojit. Uh, you know, as you said, the global economy and the consequently the markets are facing unprecedented chaos and disruption 
A lot of this has been caused by the last two, three years of excessive liquidity being pumped, pumped into the large global uh, markets, which then found its way into the, through the, uh, you know, through the stock market, into companies creating frothy valuations. It also led to a lot of people who were opting out of the workforce, basically getting used to subsidies. Uh, coupled with that, the Russia-Ukraine war, the food and energy crisis, supply chain disruptions, you know, China and, and the lockdowns that they had, all led to a perfect storm. All of this naturally led to basically investors panicking and uh, money flowing back into the, into the home markets, primarily the US, right, which you saw with the dollar strengthening. However, in the last couple of months, the market has started pricing in these risks, right? The, whether it's a Russia-Ukraine war, I think the markets decided it's going to be a prolonged affair, supply chain disruptions, everyone's trying to find alternate uh, sources of manufacturing, including India on the semiconductor side, et cetera. We're trying to become more self-sufficient. So with all of that happening, I think the markets are discounting some of these risks and capital is finding its way back into a market like India. Today, if you see India is the only large country which is showing 6 to 7% GDP growth. You and I agonize over whether it's 6 or it's 7 or it's 7.5. But look at it from where we are in a global economy where basically growth rates are 0 to 2% and even negative, right? We're talking about the second. Yes. So I think after the initial chaos, which happened in the last 6 to 8 months, we're actually coming out pretty strong, stable, robust. A country with a strong regulatory framework, stable government, you know, uh, strong consumer demand, favorable demographics. So my strong view is that the next five years, India will actually look very positive as a destination, so long as you know we don't do something which is unexpected to the markets, because because of just the factors that we just uh, outlined. Uh, and I think capital will flow in from Asia, from Middle East, from US into our country. So before going into the details of the MA activities, just wanted to have wanted to have your views on the IPO market, the Indian IPO market, which has taken a U-turn since May, uh, uh, you know, for worse. So what what according to you has led to this downturn in the IPO market, and uh, what will it take the markets to revive the IPO market? Traditionally, over the last 60, 70 years, if you see Indian companies do tend to go to the IPO market earlier than in most global economies, just because we didn't have such a strong debt uh, ecosystem. The only debt we could get was from the banking sector. And beyond that, there wasn't a strong corporate bond market. So IPOs tended to be very early stage. Last, two, last 12, 18 months was a different phenomenon. The liquidity was so excess and, you know, market, and uh, investors were looking for newer destinations, newer stories. That basically, whether it was in the private market or the public market, a lot of the companies that I believe were not even ready for the IPO market came into the market and the valuations were completely unjustified. This was, this was nothing unique to India. This was happening globally. I think with the capital getting pulled back, some of those uh, IPOs which were not, or some of those companies which were not ready for IPOs and some more which were trying to come by just you know showing growth by burning investors' hard-earned money and just, sh just showing growth for the sake of growth, those models are over. And it's very good that it's over because I think in the long term, otherwise investors would have lost money on these companies. So I'm really happy that the IPO market will now only be, be available for mature companies. Now, robust business models, which can sustain difficult and challenging periods will come into the market. And that's very good for the retail investors, especially because, you know, they tend to get carried away with a lot of this frenzy and a lot of the buzz around stocks. And that's good because I think people will not lose money. So this is this trajectory is much better than what we saw in the last 24 months. Uh, now, pharmacy has now called off its IPO. So uh, do you think that startups will, in, in, in what you said just now, do you think the startups could face uh, 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 I mean, difficulties in tapping the capital markets, particularly after the poor show by uh, Zomato and Paytm? So look, I think what happened is, uh, you know, uh, basically the the excessive liquidity resulted in immature models coming into the markets. If we step back and say the startup sector, the tech sector, am I positive on it in India? I'm hugely positive. I think it's a huge new ecosystem being created, 100 new unicorns, really robust business models in consumer fintech. You know, the young population, the use of smartphones is going to basically result in more and more of the younger population embracing technology, not just in India, but in Bharat, right? Bharat is embracing technology surprisingly even faster than you and I are embracing it, right? So I'm very robust on this sector. I think what had happened was that the valuations were running ahead of themselves. Some of the business models were not robust enough. What you will see now, Manojit, is instead of just, you know, investors finding exit in the public markets, you'll see some of these companies consolidate you see the private market basically leading to a forced consolidation, merger, m &A, which we're already seeing happening. Large corporates like Reliance, Tata's bought Big Basket, Reliance bought uh, 
uh, one, sorry, you no, know, Tata's bought one MG, Reliance bought a lot of the companies in the uh, in the uh, consumer space. You'll see some of the large corporates putting their balance sheet to work to buy some of these startups which can't sustain themselves on a standalone basis. You'll see some of these corporate uh, these startups come together, right? The business models uh, basically are complementary in two cases. They'll come together, CCI, of course, permitting. So you'll see a lot of that activity happening rather than just a rush to the public markets where the valuations were just frothy and that's why people were taking immature business models into the markets. Last year, uh, you know, the corporate sector, last few years, the corporate sector has de deleveraged themselves, cleaned up their balance sheet. Uh, the economy is also picking up and the deal street is gaining momentum. Uh, uh, which are the sectors that, uh, you know, according to you, could see more activities in the next uh, you know, two to three quarters? So there are two parts to the activity. One, as you rightly said, is the private equity and the VC funding, right? Global funding, which is coming into the market. That basically plays on the India demographics, the Indian rising consumer class, etc. cetera. So that, that money finds its way into pharma, IT services, and BPO, where we've shown a natural edge, tech, and consumer sector. That will continue. About, last year, about $80 billion of private equity and VC money came into the country and in the sectors that I outlined. So that continues to chase the same sectors. But I think what's happened, and you just said it, RJ, that what's really positive is that India Inc. deleveraged and cleaned up its balance sheets. What was happening in the last few years that if I, as an investment banker, wanted to sell an India, uh, sell a company, there was no Indian company to go to. I had to naturally just go and knock at the doors of private equity. But today, India Inc. is showing that they are wanting to do larger deals, have higher capacity. You know, Tata's bought uh, Air India through an auction. Uh, Adani went and brought Wholesome back to Indian parentage in large transaction, uh, $10 billion. Uh, you know, today now this asset is owned by Adani. So I, uh, Reliance bought the Shapoji Renewables assets. So I think that's a big positive that, and that's very important for any economy, especially in a deglobalizing world like today, where there's so much resistance on, you know, uh, going to the cheapest source, people's own home, home countries are fighting that, you know, you shouldn't be outsourcing more and more. I think an environment like this is very important for every country to have a robust uh, corporate sector in the country. And I think that's what's happened in the last five years with the forced deleveraging that happened, you know, led a lot by the banks, the NCLT process. These balance sheets of the top 30, 40 corporates are robust and they're looking to do more M&A. Uh, so there will be consolidation. Uh, and I think that that's good because, you know, the, the, for any asset now, there will be a competitive process between m and and between, sorry, corporates and private equity, uh, which will lead to better outcomes for the seller too. So uh, last year till last year, I think 60 to 70, 60 to 65 percent of the m was PE led. I expect in the next two years, it will be more like 50-50 between corporates and private equity, Indian corporates. But, but do you think IBC is a success story for banks as well? Because the haircuts are pretty steep. So, you know, uh, how do you see from a bank's point of view? So I think this was this pain was inevitable. It had to be taken. And I think it was good that it got done quickly, right? Because if it had done, Panjit, it had been done over an extended period of time, these bank stocks, balance sheet would have just languished. Today, you go to the banks, they are actually keen to do more business. They're talking about look, wanting to fund CapEx and saying, bring us more corporates who want to expand because their balance sheets are looking robust. The market is rewarding them. Uh, but, but, and you are seeing that in the multiples of these of these banks. So it was, a, a, I think it was a success. Of course, we can all argue, should I, should I be faster, quicker as Indians? We always are, are people in a hurry. But, you know, look, these things are, you know, in any, any one lending had some 35 to 40 banks. So it tends to take time. Uh, but I think it was great that India cleaned up its balance sheet in, in a time that, you know, anyway, the economy was slow. Uh, and now today, whether it's uh, the banks or corporate India, they're all ready to do more and more. You know, who would have thought that an Indian company would have been able to raise $10 billion in two months and buy a global company, right? Uh, I don't think that was something that we, in my career, I would have seen that happen so easily for India. That, that was what, what we witnessed in the wholesome trade. So it's showing you that even, even though global banks are buying into the Indian corporate's uh, story in terms of their, the health of those balance sheets and, and, and of the banks, right? So I, I think it was, a, it was a success to answer your question. Uh, coming to the financial sector, now uh, NBFC has faced difficult times in the last few years, the INFS crisis, uh, banks choking funds to them. Now we also have the HDFC bank, HDFC merger. And one of the reasons cited for the merger is that NBFCs don't, the, the regulations of NBFCs are more aligned with banks. So it is no longer advantage advantage to be an NBFC and run the business. Do you think more and more NBFCs uh, would like to with, you know, get merged with the banking entities, the commercial banks or the uh, small finance banks? 
So, Manjit, I, I feel more positive on the NBFC sector than I did in the last three years. You know, because of, as you rightly said, uh, because of the pandemic and the lockdown, basically, uh, you know, they had to give extended moratoriums, etc. They didn't have so uh, the right source of funding. ILF has created a huge issue for all of these NBFCs. It was general distrust. I think a lot of that is behind us. The NBFCs in the whole pandemic, a lot of the good ones with good parentage have actually invested a lot in technology, etc. So they're able to compete now they're, they're, they're with, with the with the banks also, the good quality one. So I feel more positive on this sector. Having said that, I, I continue to believe that this sector will see consolidation, whether it's within the sector itself, you know, the larger balance sheets, the ones that have invested in tech and innovations, the one which have good corporate parentage, will probably consolidate with the smaller ones. We have we probably have some good consumers, some good niche products, but you know, really can't sustain themselves against the banks who have also invested a lot in technology network, et cetera. And of course, as you rightly said, banks will continue to consolidate with NBFC's valuations are looking more sensible. So yes, this sector will see a lot of activity, but I, I feel cautiously more optimistic on NBFCs than I did 12 to 18 months ago. So there could be consolidation among NBFCs also. Is that a possibility you see? Yes, yes, absolutely. I see that happening. As I said before, the larger uh, NBFCs who have good corporate parentage, who have invested in tech, innovation, have access to capital, will consolidate with the smaller ones who, you know, have some niche segments that they are or niche geographies that they are strong in or have some product, some technology, which, you know, could be complementary to the large NBFCs uh, uh, efforts and initiatives. So I see consolidation within the sector. I see bank to NBFC consolidation. I see valuations now more realistic. I see private equity playing a large part because private equity has invested a lot in NBFC. So as they see the, think about their exits, they will think about consolidating with other uh, strategic private strategic players. So I see a lot of activity in the sector in the next three to five years. Yeah, I mean, recently we have seen a private equity player picking up a stake in the East Bank, which is of course the private sector bank. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, there are stake sales of IDBI Bank, Shipping Corporation, Concord. Do you think they will, at enough, uh, they will attract enough interest from Indian corporate sector or, you know, it will be overseas investors, the private equity, which will drive those uh, stake sales? No, I expect Indian corporates now to play this sector. In fact, I think these are companies which, have, which you know, to turn around, etc., probably need larger gestation periods. And I strongly believe that Indian corporates and so maybe in partnership with private equity, right? A lot of these uh, private equity may feel they don't have the bandwidth to run these companies and they need an Indian strategic who's more familiar with the landscape to partner. So you may see actually consortiums led by private by, by strategic or strategic just partner, just uh, bid, Indian strategic just bidding by themselves for these assets. I see, as I said before, I see Indian corporates today in the conversations I have with them, very, very positive on m &A. Uh, You know, 20 years ago, it was always a discussion on or an Indian corporate can always go and do a greenfield investment. And, you know, there was no need to go and pay 10 times, 12 times multiples for these uh, companies. But that's not the case. I think today, greenfield is seen as difficult, challenging, and the market, market is seen as something which is going to grow into a $5 trillion economy. So the Indian entrepreneur is saying, why don't I invest more capital into my country itself rather than go into global economies where the growth is weak uh, and anemic and, and pay those multiples because, you know, the market will reward me for it. So I, I see India, corporate India, uh, bidding very aggressively for the assets that you mentioned. On that note, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, uh, Ms. Girotra. Uh, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you for having me and pleasure meeting you. Girotra says that in the last couple of months, markets have started pricing risks and the capital is finding its way back to India. On the other side of the spectrum, the regulator is trying to rein in the menace of errant P2P lending apps. But what is P2P lending and how does it work? Our experts explain in the Banking for You section. Peer-to-peer -peer or P2P lending may attract closer scrutiny from the Reserve Bank of India now that the first tranche of digital lending guidelines is out. What is a P2P platform? Well, it is a class of non-banking financial companies, NBFC, introduced in October 2017. More simply put, it is a form of crowdfunding. It is the practice of borrowing and lending money through an online marketplace electronic platforms that only assist banks, NBFCs, and other regulated entities in identifying borrowers are not treated as P2P platforms. However, in cases where other retail lenders use the platform for lending, 
the platform will have to register separately as an NBFC P2P. Consumers on a P2P platform have the discretion of selecting the people they want to invest in or get a loan from. And just like any regulated entity, P2P platforms have to report delays and defaults by borrowers to the credit bureaus. According to the RBI's Financial Stability Report of December 2021, lending through NBFC P2P accounts for a minuscule share of aggregate NBFC lending, a mere 2,093 crore rupees as on September 30, 2021. However, there was a significant traction in activity during the pandemic period with a three-fold growth in both credit intermediated and the number of lenders owing to investors' search for higher yields in a low interest rate environment. The RBI's discussion paper on digital lending notes that current RBI guidelines clearly define the scope of activities that can be undertaken and also have safeguards for transparency, disclosure and consumer protection. But there are unlicensed digital lenders in this space. And these unlicensed lenders need to be tackled on priority by all stakeholders in the digital ecosystem, including app store operators and search engines, to prevent their distribution and usage to ensure consumer protection. In the credit segment, P2P lending platforms have emerged as a new category of intermediaries, which are either providing direct access to credit or facilitating access to credit through online platforms. Besides, there are companies primarily engaged in technology business which have also ventured into lending either directly or in partnership with financial institutions. Such companies include big techs, e-commerce platforms, telecommunication service providers, etc. In the digital lending space, we have variants of the P2P model. There is person to business, which is P2B, business to person, B2P, and business to business, B2B models. I am the blue of the limitless sky. I am the inspiration that lets success so high. I will achieve. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. It is not just P2P lending that has picked up. Credit growth has also been inching up despite higher rates. This was one reason why the banks posted considerable profits in the first quarter despite higher mark-to-market losses. Our consulting editor, Tamal Bandupadhyay, discusses the bank's performance in the first quarter in the issue of treasury losses. Tamil also sheds light on the takeaways from the recent Jackson Hole meeting. Hi, Tamal. Thanks for coming on the show again. Thank you. Now, in your recent column, you highlight the issue of treasury losses. Now, everyone was discussing how mark-to-market losses will reduce the bank's profit. Can you take us to the specifics of the sector and why it did not happen at the scale that everyone was expecting. Yes, the banking sector was apprehending uh, massive treasury losses that could erode their profits. And in fact, they did reach out to the banking regulator for concessions. Um, RBI was uh, not willing to give it. And rightly so. If you look at the statistics, the balance sheet, how the banks fared, yes, indeed, their other income, so-called other income, which consists of fees, income, and treasury uh, profit have come down, has come down. Uh, uh, but interest income has gone up because credit of tech is much better uh, than the previous few years, as well as the interest also, uh, I mean, the interest on loan uh, is rising. So the combination has uh, added to the, has contributed to the higher NIM, the so-called net interest margin. The difference between the cost at which you lend and the and the cost of the deposits. And the other part is, of course, that story of <clears throat> less and less provision requirement because your bad loans are 
going down, fresh privileges are much, much less. So you need to, you did not need uh, as much provision as, as you had been doing historically for the past few years. Uh, so these three, uh, the higher NIM and the lower provision, took care of the treasury losses, which is not too big. And um, indeed, if you look at the subtext or the other income, if you go to the fine print, you will find a lot of banks indeed uh, had made treasury losses, but their fee income is so high that could take care of the losses. This is particularly true of the uh, private sector banks, whereas some of the large public sector banks have shown as much as 80% drop both uh, quarter on quarter and year on year to uh, I mean the other income losses. Because in their case, the fee income is less. All in all, it's not a bad quarter at all. It's much better than what we had expected. And um, good run continues. Now, it's very surprising. You mentioned the credit growth part. I was checking the numbers. It's over 15% in this uh, this monthly bulletin that was released in the uh, fort like, last fortnight. Now, this has happened despite interest rates rising. Why do you think that is the case? So if you ask any borrower, I'm not talking the retail borrower, but the corporate borrower, uh, interest rate is never a deterrent for credit. You know, if it's the, the cost of credit, and if you see the entire project cost, etc., it's not that high, uh, which can prevent somebody from going, going to the bank. Uh, from going uh, reaching out to a bank and asking for loan. I mean, it's a, it's a theoretical, theor theoretical stuff, but this exactly um, is the case. Uh, interest component is a very small component of your overall project cost. I'm talking about, I'm talking about um, corporate. When it comes to retail loan, the, the EMI is going up so that definitely we, we will see uh, 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 the kind of growth we have seen both for home loans, mortgages, and, and car loan, etc., etc. Probably it will get affected. But as far as corporate in India is concerned, uh, a rising credit cost it will not be a deterrent uh, for. It's historically we have seen that. It's not a it, It's not a problem. A rise in credit growth should also translate into a rise in inflation. Personal loans are up. Credit card outstanding is up 30%. Does it mean an overheating of the economy? No, we, we have not reached we have not reached that stage. If you ask me, I'm not getting into the economics and I'm not the theories, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have seen contextually, we have not seen that kind of credit growth. You have to also see the, the base, the lower base. It's not what happened between say 2006 and 2008, or rather 2007 and 2009. You know, the credit growth was typically uh, was happening three times bigger than the than, than the growth on, in JDP. So we have not reached that stage at all. It's not a question of uh, overheating the economy uh, and, in, and a threat to inflation. We have not reached that stage. Having said that, uh, so one of the contributing factors probably of the credit growth is this. Some of the banks probably are not as, as careful and not using their discretion because the key factor is this, you know, it's a plain arithmetic. If you have a larger basket of loan, then in percentage term, your NPS go down. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying everybody is doing that, uh, but some of the banks are a little more aggressive than what they, than how they should approach this. Uh, the objective is to show lower NPA, which is very critical. Uh, they are doing it. And other part is this, Again, if you ask me, uh, uh, some part, at least some part of the credit is going to various state undertakings. So mm -hmm. the states are raising money. These state undertakings are, in fact, one of the inc incidents that uh, have, has been discussed in media. Um, so the state undertakings are taking the state guarantee. And I'm told that uh, at least two states are, have been on a verge of default. They are managing it somehow. So it, it, it does not necessarily mean that because you have a state guarantee and your quality of loan will be excellent. What happens is this, these banks at the moment they say the state guarantee, they keep their eyes closed and say they sign off, uh, you know, not looking at the project. There have been cases where SPVs are being floated and there is no sign of the project, but the banks have been giving loans to that. So my worry is this, uh, <clears throat> 
while the banks are being very aggressive uh, for their credit growth uh, to uh, you know the objective is uh, or rather it's not that there's a real demand uh, it's actually uh, the states are raised, the states are aiding to their undertakings uh, to to boost their fiscal deficit and the banks are keeping some of the banks are not as as diligent as they should be uh, they are giving money freely um, uh, to bring down their npa so that's not a good sign uh, we may see um, trouble ahead at least for some of them because we are talking about interest rates and loans and everything it is prudent that we talk about the repo rate as well at a recent jackson hole meeting fed and ecb indicated further action does it mean higher rates in india and would you revise your september forecast i will say that <clears throat> it's not end of the story they will uh, they will hike the rate i mean the perception was uh, milder but probably after the jackson hole meeting the market is preparing itself for uh, a hike as much as it happened in the past two uh, fomc meetings uh, so as as far as we are concerned i think we will we will see the two aspects of it uh, impacts on on the currency side because as we speak the dollar index hit 20 year high Yeah, study and rupee breached the uh, 80 level yet again during the day trade. Of course, RBI's intervention brought it back uh, below 80. Yeah. So currency uh, uh, will be. Uh, I mean, we'll see action on the on the currency front uh, because it's a safe haven. Uh, money will flow into that. Uh, so that's one part of it. Second part of it, yes, indeed, India cannot be isolated, even though. um at some point reserve bank of india claim that we have decoupled ourselves our inflation character trajectory is very different we don't need to bother yes indeed our inflation is not 40 year i or that kind of uh, some of the developed markets are saying but definitely inflation is a worry in fact in the past uh, few weeks both governor and uh, one deputy governor has been talking about it's too early to celebrate uh, so we would see a rate hike now how much will be my perception is um, we need to wait uh, for the uh, one more inflation figures will come before the next reserve bank of india yeah. mpc meeting uh, you know that it's not in uh, october it's in september end yeah. um, so i would rule out 50 basis point hike i will still stick to 35 uh, more possible than 25 it's between 25 and 35 but Uh, my gut feel says we will see a 35 basis hike, which will take the rate at 5.75, provided yeah. external circumstances everything remains the same and inflation is nudging down. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. It was great talking to you. Hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Kamal says India is not as isolated from the world as one would want it to be. so any decision by global central banks will impact the currency and inflation front however he sticks to his 35 basis point hike forecast for the end september policy meeting we had asked you if upi transactions should have a minimal fee last time four out of five people or 80% of our respondents voted against charges on upi transactions upi as the government says indeed has become a public good This week we would like to know if you think RBI and the government have done enough to ensure cyber security discipline among banks. Our polls will open on Friday and you can respond on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and our website. We'll be back next week with more news and analysis. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.